now. Uh, so. Oh no! Oh no! Uh, let's. More filming. Different filming. Uh, okay. I'm just gonna make sure that it's actually going. <laughs> okay. I, I, I suppose I can stick around until then. Just as soon as we see, it says live now in the YouTube's. So as soon as we see people say a thing. Oh, good. That's fine. Things say people. Things say people. People say things. Wow. It's all kinds of conversation going there already. Wow. Aha. We've been live for 19 seconds, apparently. Not it's alive. It's alive. Okay, I'm going to put some headphones on. Uh, see ya. That was awesome, Chad. Yeah, that was... Uh, do this again like two months, yeah? <laughs> two months, yeah. Maybe filming on uh, maybe filming on Sunday, the four episodes or something? That would be great. Yeah. This Sunday? Yeah. Uh, I don't think I'm ready for this Sunday, no. but we'll talk next yes. week. Okay. All right. All right. Because remember, I'm live right now. Backpack. Take your backpack. All right. It's your backpack. Bye. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> awesome. So someone so is complimenting episode. my necklace, and they can't even see the awesomeness that is the oh, octopus on. that was on my necklace. What you saying? Okay. <laughs> Well, sir, what was that? Someone was complimenting my necklace, and I'm like, and they can't even see the awesome little cephalopod that's on my necklace. Where did that come from? Is Balticon. Balticon. Yes. Someone is saying they're getting a bit of an echo. Well, they were. I had my he I had my speakers on, and now I've got my headphones on like a professional, so <clears throat> it shouldn't be a problem now. Uh, and now I don't have an engineer, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna like leave it on this window and go from there okay so this is our final episode for the, the season. season yeah yeah not our final episode ever just our final episode yeah. of the season um, you, you say it in the most distressing I, word order possible because I, I get a little kick out of it not gonna lie <laughs> uh, just yeah. like giving people heart attacks uh no no um just to be dramatic <laughs> okay um, yeah, so so let's talk about what's going to happen. So we're going to do this final episode. It's a super weird one. Well, it's not going to be a super weird episode. The topic is super weird. Yes. Um, and then we're going to stick around. We're going to answer some of your questions about space and astronomy. Then we're going to wrap this season up. And what that means is you're going to work on NASA-related CosmoQuest projects. I'm going to keep filming the Guide to Space also go camping with the family things like I'm that I'm going camping next week wonderful and then uh we shall return you're gonna go to dragon con in yes uh september, september labor day and yeah. uh and then after that hopefully you're gonna, you're gonna do you're gonna bring back audio yes from that that's the goal that is the goal and maybe multiple kinds of audio if if various panels happen yeah. that are appropriate for astronomy cast um and then we're going to uh, September 9th is the window for the Osiris Rex launch. Yes, and I think all of us are planning to go to that. And I'm just waiting for NASA to tell me where they're going to put me. Not in space. No, but honestly, Bennu would be a long, lonely ride. So I'm okay with that. Uh, Larry Beckham asks if I got any more radiation poisoning. I sure did. It's it is hilarious <laughs> that I went out into the sun. That I that oh, I yes. of the of the team. I'm the one who spends a lot of time out in the sun. Yeah, I don't know if you can let's see here. You can see my my farmer's tan. <laughs> so. Yeah. So so the hilarious thing is, I'm normally much much darker than Fraser, but. We have been so understaffed with CosmoQuest. And if you're a data scientist, we are still desperately seeking to hire a data science postdoc. Um, yeah. If you are a planetary science or an astronomy or a helio or an earth scientist who processes data and wants to be a data scientist, we might hire you. Please apply, please. Um, but other than that one position, I think we are almost fully staffed at SIUE and maybe like I can see a little bit of sunshine because I, I was saying I wear flip flops all the time and i don't even have tan lines on my feet oh that is that is sad yeah well you know a big part of it is that my wife is a macro photographer go go check out instagram carla thompson um but uh 
And so we've planted a ton of like flowers and various things to attract bugs outside. And so I've actually been doing a ton of gardening. And so a lot of it is just being out in the sunshine and and being the spotter looking for bugs. So it's uh, so it's been it's been good. And then lots of uh, just getting out in the sun. Just go. Cool. It's it's been it's actually it's been very wet here this spring. But uh, hopefully things are going to turn around. Yeah, I, I normally spend a lot of time outside, just not this year, and our yard is not going to be on the garden tour this year. No? Oh, uh, yeah, we're not ready for the garden tour yet. I think we've still got a couple of more years to go, a little more, a little more cleaning up to do. I was, a very, uh, yeah, I was very bad for many years and let things overgrow, but we're, we're on top of it now. Our, our house hasn't been on the garden tour since we bought the house. <laughs> it was it was before that <laughs> right and, and so now you're just coasting on the uh as the place all falls apart yes. cool okay so let's do this um let's do this thing that we like to call uh, astronomy cast uh oh. and then of course this is also the the end of preston not these die guy i gotta change the way i say this this is the last time preston is gonna be editing audio for us so thanks Preston for everything um oh I forgot to open my audio recorder oh, I'm ready I'm not <sighs> and this is where everyone learns from where I'm awkwardly staring in strange directions that I'm definitely using two screens okay um I'm ready to press record I am also ready to press record I have an intro I gotta get my brain into astronomy cast mode I have rest record. It is recording. I, I, I am recording too. We are recording together. Hooray. All right. And now uh, let me do my intro. Astronomy Cast, episode 418. I am a teapot. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Cain. I'm the publisher of University Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? I'm doing great. So last week, it was the penultimate episode. This is the ultimate episode, our final show before we go on break. Uh, wrapping up this season of Astronomy Cast. What is it? Season 9? Season 10? We really should... Season 10. Season 10. We have wrapped up Season 10. We were podcasting for podcasting was cool. And yes. It's cool, and we're still podcasting. Yes. And the, and the trick, the secret, is to take a break every now and then. It's true. It's true. So over this summer, while people are uh, detoxing because they're not listening to Astronomy Cast, what else could they do that relates to the projects that you're working on? Where should they go and, and sort of catch up? So, so we are getting ready to launch a whole bunch of awesome things over at CosmoQuest with a lot of help from Interface Guru. Uh, we are getting ready to redo our website so it's easier to find things, easier to navigate. And along the way, we're going to be launching a whole bunch of new content, new products, new tasks, new ways that you can learn and do science. And um, along the way, we're also going to be launching information about our Eclipse uh, 2017 plans here in St. Louis. And uh, yeah, so stay tuned. Follow, follow CosmoQuest X on Twitter. Uh, follow it on Facebook, and you'll be able to keep up with everything we're doing. And what about you? What all are you up to this Well, summer? so we're still going to be producing the Guide to Space videos. And in fact, I'll have a little more time to shoot and record and maybe go some more interesting locations. I want to start doing some stuff that's a little bit longer, a little bit slicker. So we're going to be putting some energy into that. We're going to be, so if you haven't already, go and subscribe to the Universe Today channel. We're going to be doing a bunch of improvements actually to these shows. So we've got plans to, to make a bunch of intro videos and better graphics graphics and stuff to make these even slicker and make it feel a lot more like television, but not television. Um, so that's so that's what's going to be in the work. So of course, Universe Today, every day, many stories, come and join us and read. And if you didn't listen to the Weekly Space Hangout, go ahead and catch up. We've got a whole year. Our, our ultimate episode there was with uh, Dr. James Green, who is the Director of Planetary Science for NASA. And uh, what a treat to hear him 
talk about that. And I think the big thing is Juno, which I hope yes. maybe by the time people listen to this, they will be Juno will be at Jupiter. But that is going to be the big news that we're going to be super busy with all all uh, all summer long. I'm I'm really excited about that. And and we do have to say one final sad bit of news in this ultimate episode of season 10 and this is after watching him go through his undergrad years working with us at SIUE and finish a graduate program out in Savannah Georgia and go on to get a great professional job Preston's professional job has finally reached the point where he has to say goodbye to editing astronomy cast so in the fall we will be looking for a brand new student to help them get some well experience working on doing the real thing. So come fall, we'll be looking for a new SIUE student to take over the helm and help us, well, maybe not stick around for another 10 years, but another three or four is what we're hoping for. So thanks, Preston. We really appreciate having you along for this journey. And uh, we look forward to uh, all of the cool stuff you're working on. We'll we'll keep people updated on what you, what you get up to. It, it's been a great ride. And we hope that everything's just upwards and onwards for you in your brave new next set of endeavors. All right, uh, now for the show part. So one of the most familiar asterisms in the night sky is the teapot in Sagittarius. Seriously, it looks like a teapot. Go and check. Uh, today we're going to talk about that and a bonus conversation about Bertrand Russell's teapot argument. Pamela, uh, yes. where did you get this title from? This is all so, you. So I have to admit, I've been greatly enjoying the fact that the numbers of our episodes have started to hit HTML, HTTP error codes. So, so <laughs> I, I write, I write a lot of websites. And and when when you're doing curl to try and go back and forth across different pages, uh, sometimes you get back error codes and some of them are just plain fun. And error code 418 is, I'm a teapot. And, and so that seemed like an excellent Easter egg, an excellent final episode of the season. And considering how broken our real world is, let's enjoy being a teapot for just one afternoon because it's a whole lot better than reality. Okay, so let's talk about the asterism first. So for people who haven't, uh, I guess, are, you know, aren't super familiar with the night sky, what is the teapot? So, so if you go outside, uh, now, actually, fairly late in the evening, you will be able to see uh, the Milky Way rising. And as the Milky Way rises, um, there is this teapot asterism. It is a set of stars that forms the brightest part of the constellation Sagittarius. And it looks like a little teapot with a handle that, that meets at the top and the bottom and the little spout that goes out. And to me, it's always looked like someone knocked that teapot over and it had cream in the tea and it spilled all over the sky in this nice long line tracing out our Milky Way galaxy. For the us in the Northern Hemisphere, right? If you're yes. in the Southern Hemisphere, you see it fully dumped over and tumbling, right? I'm trying to think. Well, it it's... I, it depends on your perspective looking at how it fell on the, the table. But yeah, it's dumped over for both the north and the south. For us looking at it, it's like the teapot got knocked over away from you. From the south, it looks like the teapot got knocked over towards you. It's knocked either, knocked over however you look at it. Now, we call it an asterism, and that's different from a constellation, even though it's inside a constellation, right? And the, I guess the closest analogy of this is the Big Dipper, which is which isn't a constellation. Exactly. So there's there certain patterns of stars that that pattern is all entirely bright, can easily be made out. And we call them what they actually look like. So there's the W in Cassiopeia, which isn't entirely Cassiopeia, but makes out what we can really see. There's the coat hanger asterism that you need a telescope to see, but it's a set of stars that look entirely like a coat hanger. It's kind of creepy. In the case of the teapot in Sagittarius, the brightest stars in this particular constellation form a short stout teapot. Right. Um, so, okay, so that is the that is the teapot, that is the asterism, and it's in a very important region of the of the sky. What's going on in there? 
what's really cool is you can use the teapot to figure out exactly where the center of our galaxy is. So if you're looking at the teapot on the one side, you have the handle on the other side, you have the spout. I'm not going to sing the song. Oh. Uh, if you go off of the spout stars from the bottom base of the teapot up to where the tea would get poured out, follow that line and just arc ever so slightly. So if you form a straight line, there's a bright star you'll see and just toward the teapot direction, uh, there's, there's a, you can't see it, but there's a place that happens to be uh, where the black hole in the Milky Way hangs out. Uh, so there's a 4 million solar mass black hole that looks like it got spilled out of Sagittarius's teapot. Uh, and so, all, you know, is the, the galaxy core is there and, and there's a lot of really great uh, nebulae and clusters and stuff like that that's that's all around it. This is actually one of the best places to get your first introduction to the sky when you get your first really good set of binoculars because you can lie down in a lawn chair in a hammock and find that bright asterism and then trace along the Milky Way which you may not be able to see from where you live but because you know the teapot fell over and spilled it out the spout, just look all along the spout and that's where the Milky Way is. And with your binoculars, you will be able to see this over density of stars. And right near the teapot is the Lagoon Nebula, which is bright enough to see through binoculars. There's star clusters in all directions. Straight up from the lid of the teapot is the Swan Nebula. It's, it's an amazingly rich part of the sky that you can just sort of fall into with binoculars. Yeah, I, you know, there's a couple of, of constellations that really serve as these waypoints for you. One, you know, for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, I have no idea why the people in the Southern Hemisphere are just stumbling around in the darkness because they can't see Polaris and, and such. But, um, but still, so, you know, the Big Dipper, of course, Cassiopeia, as you mentioned, Orion. But in the summertime, you're looking for that that teapot and for us here in canada it's pretty low on the horizon it's actually a pretty low view to that to that object and right beside it is um scorpio which also really yes. looks like its namesake and and scorpio is kind of cool because multiple cultures that didn't have contact with one another at the time they were naming the constellations all looked at it and went that's a scorpion we're gonna name it a scorpion and and so you no have question. this section of the sky where the constellation Sagittarius, I, I can't get the Greek mythology picture out of it, but a teapot sitting next to a scorpion seems like a rather terrifying Texas kind of thing. And for me, the first time I was really able to see Scorpio, Scorpius was when I was down in Texas. And it's like, there's the teapot, there's the scorpion, these two things don't belong together. Right. Um, so what is the best way to really appreciate this constellation and, and what it has? I love, you know, because it it has a lot of stuff that you can see almost with the unaided eye, stuff that you can mm -hmm. see with, uh, you know, with binoculars. Where would you get started to really get to know it? So so for me, the, the best thing to do is pull up Stellarium figure out where it is in your sky and then go outside with no plan and something that doesn't have a motor. So a binocul set of binoculars, a Dobsonian telescope and start off that bottom of the spout and just go use that as a direction, go up through the spout, find that over density of stars that makes up the Milky Way, head in the direction of the lid of the teapot along that density of stars. And as you shoot along that over density of stars, you're just gonna stumble, out, stumble over dust and gas and star clusters and all of these young things that well, show how active the inner part of our galaxy is, where there is still rich star formation going on. There are young clusters that haven't yet been torn apart by their orbits around the galaxy. And, and then once you've really just sort of gone as far as you can go with 
either that Dobsonian or that pair of binoculars. Now it's time to go attach your camera to something so that you can get a deeper exposure and start to see, oh my gosh, there's all this amazing color in this part of the sky. And there's nothing quite as, as magical in a way than setting up your just normal everyday Canon generic, like low end rebel camera. Yep. on some sort of a tripod and getting a good 30 second exposure or so of this region of the sky and realizing there is all of this stuff that just fills the sky that you just can't see with your eyes. Yeah, and all of those, the famous nebula, all the ones that you're all familiar with, right? The Lagoon Nebula and the Eagle Nebula and the Triffid Nebula and, you know, not the Orion one, but the, but the most of the other really interesting nebulae are all located in that same region. And you just, as you said, you know, you take a, a Canon or Nikon camera, set it for a, a long exposure, uh, point it at that region of the sky, and, you know, either something that's very wide field, but even something that is, you know, like a 50 millimeter or, or something like that, and then just take your 30 second exposure, you know, whatever has a good um, uh, aperture, nice wide aperture. Like if you can get your hands on like a 1.4, or like a 1.8, uh, I'm sure that's gibberish to a lot of people, but you want one that, that is fairly fast lens. And, uh, you know, as you say, you get the all of the stuff in the Milky Way, and then you get all of these blobs of different colors. And it's just, it's stunning. And it is the, it is the place to start. I really think, you know, if a person wants to get into astrophotography, that all those beautiful nebulae that people have on their computer desktop backgrounds and things like that, they're all there. That's, and you just, you know, it's just how much you've zoomed in to, to see them, so. And, and what really gets me about looking in the direction of Sagittarius is you never run out of new depths to go to. Uh, they just set up a new instrument on the very large telescope that links all four of these giant mirrors together. It's, it's called gravity, someone forced an acronym. And this particular instrument is designed to allow them to do very careful interferometric observations of the stars that are closest to the supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy. So you can drink in the beauty of Sagittarius from the, hey, I'm outside in a dark site with my eyeballs. Hey, I'm outside with a pair of binoculars, maybe not even in a dark site, to, hey, I'm using the largest collective set of glass on the planet to observe this, this system and understand what it's like within a solar system sized region around that supermassive black hole. Yeah, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, so let's let's now completely and totally shift gears. <laughs> Uh, we've talked about th that version of the teapot, uh, probably the one that's closest to the HTTP error code. Let's talk about the uh, the other one, and this is the the uh, the Bertram Russell's uh, teapot uh, uh, thought experiment what, argument. It, it, what is the it, what is the best way to describe this? It's it's a philosophical argument, and usually we don't bring the these kinds of things up in astronomy because in astronomy cast because we do try and have a facts based journey through the universe. Um, and this, this is this is logic 101 versus observational astronomy 101. Um, but since we're talking about being a teapot today, it seemed like a good direction to go in. I, I actually learned about this this argument uh, from Surly Amy, who started making these adorable necklaces that have a teapot floating out among the planets. And I was, I was perplexed, and rather than admit to it, I went and Googled. Uh, luckily, her Etsy page uh, labeled it as Russell's teapot, which made it easy. And, and I found out about an argument on um, basically proof of ideas. And, and the argument is that you can't simply say my idea must be true for other people based on the fact that those other people can't prove the negative of the idea. This is generally brought up as a, you can't say that God exists because you can't disprove God. And, and the, the way that he put this, the Gedanken experiment, if you will, was 
And I love the fact that he used the word elliptical in this argument. He said, if I were to tell you that there is a little China teapot in an elliptical orbit out between Earth and Mars, and I was to tell you that it was too small to perceive with even the most highly technological telescope here on Earth, you would laugh at me. And you would say, that's not out there. You can't convince me it's out there. And the fact that you can't prove that it's not out there is not sufficient reason for me to argue that, yes, of course, there is a teapot out there. So it, it's a way of, of basically saying through logical thought experiment, um, you can't force me to believe something just because I can't negate it, but rather the burden is on the other person to prove that the thing exists if they want it to be a logical argument. Right. And so, you know, you said, I mean, we don't bring philosophy into astronomy cast too often. Where would we see an argument like this in, in astronomy, in cosmology, things like that? So uh, one interesting place that it's cropped up over the years is the argument over whether or not there should be life out there. Because currently, it's simply a belief statement. There, there is no way to say, yes, there is alien life. No, there is not alien life. We, we have no evidence to prove or disprove it. So it is insufficient for someone to say, of course, there is alien life. And you don't have the ability to negate my argument, therefore I must be right. Because the only way that I could negate your argument is to scan every single world in the entire universe looking for life down to the atomic level to find out whether or not it doesn't exist and only by having scanned. And that's just life as we know it. Then I have to come back around and you go, yeah, but it could be some form of crystalline intelligent cloud entity and then i have to start the whole search again this time looking for crystalline cloud entities and be like yeah no 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 it's it's on it's in another dimension it's phase shifted from us and you're gonna have to take another crack at it and so then i go and again you know furiously search every single world in the entire observable universe searching for these phase shifted uh invisible uh aliens and you would then just shift the shifted again so so the, you know that's back to that you know you can't prove a negative right and and this also gets at the extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence side of 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 the argument of it's not sufficient in the case of things like aliens to simply say oh i have this little bit of possible evidence from what the mariner uh or sorry what the viking probes did on mars that's wussy, not conclusive evidence. You have to have overwhelming evidence when you're trying to prove extraordinary things. And so on one side, you have Bertrand's teapot saying it's it's not sufficient for me to say, hey, there's a teapot in an elliptical orbit between Earth and Mars. You can't disprove me. Therefore, I must be right. Yeah. You can't say that about aliens either. So it gets, But the flip side... Okay is is the easy way right which is that you just have to prove a positive so if you say i am certain it is my argument that there are no aliens in this universe and then you say oh found one then my argument is invalidated and that's how science works right i mean that's the heart of science is, is yes. to go that way and not the other way but but this is where it still has to be extraordinary evidence. And we've seen so many different things where people brought forward evidence that just wasn't quite fully baked. There was the Mono Lake life that wasn't built on DNA argument a few years ago, where they were trying to argue that the life was using phosphorus uh, in, instead, and it just didn't quite pan out when other people repeated the experiments. And, and so it's going to have to be extraordinary evidence. But we've seen that happen. This is what happened with the supernova results that we were talking about, I think, last week. With, uh, in 1998, all of a sudden, two different research teams realized, oh, my gosh, our, our universe is accelerating in its expansion rate. This means that there has to be an extra term that that well, dark energy. 
Right, right. But I, I guess what I was just saying is, is that, you know, if if I say that there is, you know, it is my theory that we are alone in the universe, right? I'm making a truth claim. I'm saying we are yeah. the only life in the universe. And I'm, you know, and that is a, that is a truth claim that is uh, testable, right? Mm -hmm. Because all you have to do is find one instance of life anywhere but Earth, and my truth claim is rendered incorrect. Yes, it's true. And, you know, and that, and that in many cases, scientists make a, they come up with a theory, they describe the evidence that, that they are using to form that theory, but they are also open to and often suggest the evidence, the piece of evidence that would completely and utterly invalidate their theory. Yes. And, and this is where we do see the Higgs boson was found. It didn't have to be there but it was found. We see good scientific theories are ones that are predictive. Now, with, with Bertrand Russell's teapot, I, I have to admit, part of me really hopes that someday someone will launch a teapot with a message inside of it, a little China teapot, into an elliptical orbit between the Earth and Mars that might rattle around the solar system for a few thousand years before someone happens to go, what is this? And pick it up. Yeah. I think it's kind of like the ultimate bottle in the ocean kind of, of, of thing. And I desperately hope that someone someday puts a little China teapot in orbit. But according to quantum mechanics, yes. Aren't there, uh, isn't there a non-zero chance of a teapot randomly forming over an infinite amount of time? Yes, there, there is a non-zero probability, but that doesn't mean it's an actual probability. And if the universe is infinite, and we can assume that the universe is also going to exist for an infinite number of t amount of time, and a teapot is a physical object that can exist in the universe. Doesn't that mean, according to that same quantum mechanics rule, that not only are teapots randomly popping into existence, but there are an infinite number of teapots randomly popping into existence? Given a multiverse, yes. It's not even a multiverse, just an infinite universe. Not necessarily in our solar system, though. No, 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 in some other solar system, some other yes. sucker. So I guess that's true. He said there is one in our solar system, and yes. that would require an infinite amount of time. <laughs> it's awesome. I love the argument. I love this the, is I love I the wanted argument. to do this episode. <laughs> the, the, I never get a chance to get philosophical. This is great. But the, you know, <laughs> another sort of version of that is uh, Carl Sagan in A Demon Haunted World does a, a really great kind of similar version of that talking about the dragon in his in his garage i believe and it's a yes. very similar argument and and really you know for me as a skeptic that was one of the arguments that uh was just hammered the point home so beautifully and kind of taught me to be a, a skeptic and and uh you know i've really kind of enjoyed uh, those kinds of philosophical arguments. And of course, these are the dragons that we battle as we try to explain science out on the internet. And and I have to say my favorite version of this of all is of course the flying spaghetti monster. W what is the, I don't understand. So the, the flying spaghetti monster was um, no. a non-disprovable yes. religion put forward. And so the idea was, um, People, there, there's actually a beautiful treatise written up if you Google flying spaghetti monster. And, and the, the idea is uh, there are Pastafarians who uh, follow his noodley appendage and uh, have argued against uh, a lot of the uh, fanatical Christian, not biblically based ideas against evolution and and have have been fighting to to keep religion out of schools using their pastafarian arguments. Yeah, the gist is that if that if it's reasonable to teach the controversy between a you know, science, which is an evidence based comprehensive study of the natural world, and you're only postulating things that you have evidence for. And this thing someone makes up, 
uh, then it's also perfectly legitimate to then teach the controversy between science, this thing someone made up, and this other thing that somebody made up. Why not? And so uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful argument. And I think that you should totally, uh, if you haven't read the history of where the flying spaghetti monster came from, it's, it, it's wonderful. It, it was used in, in an argument uh, confronting the Kansas school board, and it was originally written up by Bobby Henderson, who wrote The Gospel of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. And it's one of those things that no matter what your religious or a religious perspective is, you should be able to appreciate the, the context of where it's coming from in, in a country that is purportedly uh, divided between religion and state being completely separate. Yeah. Well, on that note, I think we need to wrap up this episode, this season, this uh, DECA season of DECA season. We have completed a decade of doing, we have spent one fourth of our lives doing this show. Yeah, totally. (laughs) Who knew uh, that we would still be doing this 10 years later? I knew. You knew. I knew. Uh, But but I'm so glad that we did. And don't worry, we got a zillion more. We have an infinite number of shows in our respective melons. So uh, we will see all of you uh, in September. And and thanks for listening. Thanks for for watching. And uh, and thanks, Pamela, for bringing the brain. And thank you for making this fun to do year after year after year. Awesome. All right. We'll see you next season. See you in the fall. Bye. All right. I'm and now we save. save. Now we save. Don't go anywhere. We're going to take your questions for save. the last time Project this season. Of this sem- Yes. You like to say. I, d- I do. I do. All right. So my husband's dog has been avoiding me all week. And now, now that we're recording, she's like, and now I will come over and poke you with my cold, wet nose. Let's make this happen. All right. Uh, I'm going to save it. And don't forget to transfer it to the Dropbox. Yeah. <laughs> like we both we both did. Yes. We, we were so uh, determined to make sure that we didn't ruin our hangout with the Dropbox going that, um, yeah, there was a slight delay in editing this week. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so just a reminder, if you want to ask us some questions, go ahead and post them in the chat box on YouTube and uh, I will dig through them. Um, all right. There's an impressively full scroll bar. Um, so Galaxia asks, are there any Americans here? Any new astronomy docs, please? I'm craving for new astronomy document- documentaries. Any new astronomy related document? documentaries not not that documentaries. i can think of. um and yeah i can't i can't think of any you know if you it haven't is, seen it yet go see particle fever yeah so there's a, and also we had them on uh last week about the um uh ligo experiments they've got some documentaries on the ligo website that they've been making about the discovery of gravitational waves. So, yeah. so that's really cool. Um, you know, it is definitely, it's a funny time where we're in this in-between time where like broadcast television has had a lot of energy for doing this kind of thing, Discovery Channel, things like that. And now it's the, you know, they've, I don't know, they've been doing less of it, um, more scripted stuff. Well, so, not only that, but they're doing more false science. There, There's mm. this current series on the venom hunters that broke some various treaties on how you handle endangered animals there's there's a whole beautiful set of investigative blog reports right now on how this documentary is is actually like bad science like yeah. kind of up there with the mega ladon type yeah it's just bad one of my objectives with a guide to space uh is to make something to grow into a documentary, but to do it under sort of my own control. We've, you know, we've had offers in the past with Astronomy Cast. People have wanted to like do a, get our, get our involvement in more mainstream TV show type stuff. And I think if the right opportunity came along, we would definitely jump at it. You've been yeah. interviewed on History Channel and, yeah. and things like that. Um, but I don't know anyone who does sort of 
really kind of in-depth, really solid science. Cosmos was wonderful. Let's hope there's another season coming. Um, if not, I think it's going to be the mantle is going to fall to us in the next couple yeah. of years to do to do more and better and in-depth and hopefully higher budget kinds of, of projects. And, and with CosmoQuest, we are going to have some opportunities that we haven't had in the past because uh, we're partnering with Youngstown State University, with De Anzo College, and with Lawrence Hall of Science to work on creating um, trailers about our citizen science shows, to create planetarium shows on a more frequent basis, to create content designed to be used in museums, on science, on the sphere, on the dome, and to also be re-rendered for your YouTube screen, or for those of you in Germany on Vimeo. People are mentioning in the chat, uh, BBC does a lot of stuff, and definitely, yeah. you know, they're, they've are they been putting a lot of great stuff in Sky at Night, mm -hmm. uh, one episode per uh, month, but, you know, that unfortunately that's not good for Americans. Uh, any other YouTube, Steve Heisen asks about YouTube channels that have good scientific documentaries. Uh, have you, if you haven't already, check out Kurgazagd, and I tried yeah. it. So they do great animated short mini documentaries. They're absolutely wonderful. And if they don't make something break out and do something big and, and you know, in the next couple of years, I think it's going to be great. Uh, Stu H is recommending Horizon. It's funny, it's all stuff in Europe. Um, there's, there's a ton of good stuff coming out of Europe right now. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so James Haney is saying reality TV has infested true science-based television. I think that's, you know, I think that's yeah. true. Um, it's really kind of frustrating. Uh, Renko Prozo asks, any more live appearances for us? Yes. I'm going to be at a star party in Colorado next weekend that Hal Bidlack is one of the organizers for. Um, I believe the acronym is RMMS. It's outside of Colorado Springs. I'm digging, digging, digging to make sure I don't lie to you. RMSS. Right. Uh, so if you go to rmss.org, you can find out all about that. It's it's up in the mountains. Camping is involved. I'm really excited. Um, and then, of course, I'll be at Dragon Con yep. uh, later in the year. And then uh, we're going to be in Florida for the launch of Osiris Rex. So yes. um, it's kind of weird because we're going to be, I mean, you're sort of behind the wall. So I don't know if we're going to be able to do some stuff with well, like I think behind the be press behind wall. The wall but... as well with the media. Yeah. So I yeah. will probably be behind the same wall. I just don't know if we'll be at the same viewing site. Yeah, I haven't still decided whether I'm you know, going to invite, I haven't decided whether I'm going to be media or be sort of hang out with the actual mission people, but we'll, we'll figure that out. Okay. Um, so some people in the chat, they're recommending back to the previous conversation. Uh, Sci Show Space is great. Greed, uh, they're wonderful. Um, Vsauce, of course, if you haven't watched yes. Vsauce, they're so good. Yeah. In fact, uh, Crash Course Astronomy, which our buddy Phil Plate did with the folks at Sci Show is wonderful. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there's, you know, and that's, and that's it. I mean, we are in this place. We are in this in between time. Like if you see what we're doing with the Universe Today channel, we've done animations, we've done pictures, we've done interviews, we've done all the pieces yeah. that is a documentary, Document yeah. documentary, documentary, God. <laughs> um, so that is the plan. Uh, PBS Space Time is good um uh on yeah which is great and so you know they've so pbs is doing a great job of turning of of doing a fulfilling youtube based but science programming so that's great uh let's get some more questions here um oh actually you know what and sean kenny notes that nasa tv and i think this is another big part of it is that nasa is doing a great job and ESA are mm -hmm. doing great jobs of of just producing video content that relates to the stuff they're yeah. working on. They're, they are documentaries. So check that out. Um, documentary. Why, why am I having a problem with that word today? Anyway. Um, okay. Never mind. Uh, any other questions that you have? Okay. Margot Robinson asks, I live in an area with light pollution. How do I get around that? I, well, you can get in a car and go somewhere, but that's kind of the lame and difficult answer. Well, um, I mean, it's but I think it's a it's a fine answer, right? There's some great tools to help you map yourself on planet Earth, the Dark Sky Finder, and then 
where you got to go to get better colors. And, and we've seen some people get some pretty good results doing imagery using narrowband filters. So using, for instance, H-alpha filters, um, calcium filters, oxygen filters. It all depends on the size of your aperture, what filter you can use. But by looking in a very specific color of light, you're able to knock out a lot of that light pollution, which is luckily more and more just in the sodium colors. Uh, the other thing you can always do is get a little altitude if it's cloudy in your city, especially if it's like foggy. I've seen some wonderful pictures that people have taken where they climbed a nearby mountain when their city was foggy and the fog cuts the light pollution and you get to see the Milky Way and you get to see the constellations. It's, it's a really neat effect. And, and in the cities that are mega cities, you can actually get lucky if you're on top of one of the mega structures um, and have the clouds beneath you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here where I live, uh, we often will get fog in like November, December, and it's just, it's awful. And you just, you know, it's just so sad and depressing, but you just go up the top of the nearby mountain, the ski mountain, and it's beautiful and sunny and you're just, you know, warm sometimes and you just like mm -hmm. hang out and uh, you don't have to experience the, the cold and wet. So uh, yeah, so so try, I, so do a Google search for the Dark Sky Finder. It works in uh, sort of in the US and Canada, and it literally just shows you this great map of, of bad light pollution over yeah. top of Google Maps. And then you can zoom right in and you're looking for, you know, bad light pollution is like yellows and reds and oranges, but you're looking for places that are blue or black. Uh, where I live, it's a it's blue, and there's regions of black all around me, and so I can just I can go five minutes in almost any direction and get to nice pure dark skies. But I don't know if you've seen the the research now. I think eighty percent of Americans can't see the Milky Way. Yeah, right. I think it's not just Americans. I think it's globally. Well, globally, it's terrible too. But just you know, specifically yeah. Americans, they have just awful light pollution, and they have to go further and further. Yeah, <clears throat> we we also do have which Europe doesn't have. We do have large dark swaths where no one wants to live because it's hot and dry. So we do still have New Mexico and Arizona and so many of the des high desert areas. Uh, David Joseph Wesley wants to know, does your angel hair pass to turn white if you see the flying spaghetti monster with your own eyes? Yes. Raw man. Um, let's see. Matt asks, has a cat ever been to space? Yes. Did the Russians send one? Cats have been to space, I think. Dogs for sure. Yeah. Oh, now I'm... Now I'm there have not yet been any pigs in space, which I find greatly discouraging. Um, and uh, people are mentioning in the chat that cats have been sent into weightlessness. Yes. Um, There's all sorts of videos of that, yes. which is fabulous. Cats have been sent to space. Uh, 1963? Who did it? Uh, Surma? France. The French did it. Yeah. That, I did not know the French did that. There you go. Uh, they launched it while well, aboard a sounding rocket in 63. And then a second one, uh, October 24th. Uh, and the cat was found dead. Second cat died. First cat. First cat survived. lived. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I love how they don't mention the name of the second cat that died. You only yeah. get a name if you live. Yeah. Uh, we did an episode of the Guide to Space on this, and like the history of animals in space is is pretty nasty. <laughs> uh, almost everything has been shot up into space, except for, as you said, pigs. But you know, all kinds of primates, and not a lot of them survive. A lot of Dogs. invertebrates. Yeah, yeah, nematodes. Now, water bears—they're like, strap me in, let's go. But, yeah, they were uh, born for space. Yeah, they were ready for space. Um. I always mention that in the, uh, you know, when the star shot gets sent, you know, with this tiny little spacecraft, they should build tardigrade crew quarters in there. They're like Kerbals. The, yes. The tardigrades. They're ready. Yes. Um, yes. I think, speaking of, I think the Kerbal Space Program is on discount during the Steam sale right now. 
Oh, that's, that's was, exciting. Yeah, it was like it was 40% off a couple of days ago. I'm not sure when it is now. I saw um, something hilarious on the Ruin a Video Game hashtag earlier today. It was uh, add space grants to Kerbal Space Program. That's, you, have to that's grants how, in order to <laughs> you have to write a grant. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. It would totally ruin the game. That would ruin the game. so much more real. Oh. Yeah, you have a you have a very special skill in in writing grants. It really is your superpower. Um, uh, Sylvan Westby says that turtles went behind the moon. Really? Cool. Huh? Turtles went behind the moon. So That's maybe cool. a spacecraft carrying turtles. I'm going to Google this. Yeah. I like turtles. Um, <laughs> Margaret Roberts says that the ISS should have a pet cat. That would be hilarious. I wonder what would be the best pet on ISS. Man, this, this if you is could litter box a bird, it feels like a bird. Because yeah. I think everything else would have trouble figuring out how to get around and like end up stranded in the middle of a room being very upset. But a, you figure a bird would learn but, to fly in in microgravity. Yeah, yeah, my concern would just be the the refuse because bird poo in space would be horrific. Yes. Well, but wait, because it's not going to drop on you. It's just going to be this little blob that's floating. It would be a jetpack blob. Oh, There's four true, blobs. true, true, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Hmm. Yeah, so like a gray, uh, African gray that knows how to speak and operate things yeah, in a and diaper. Yeah, and wears it in a diaper. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. <laughs> you can just imagine the, the, the parrot sort of flying around, opening up doors, zipping around, hanging out. I think an African gray is smart enough to figure that stuff out. Hmm. <laughs> All right. I think that is uh, that is Someone a level make it of happen. that is a level of mayhem that uh, needs to be tested uh, until we've got the uh, you know the rotating spaceships and then it's you know less of a problem. Um, let's see. Any other questions? Anybody got any questions? Ready for questions? Universe Sandbox is 20% off, Elab, Avron, mm -hmm. Um David Joseph Wesley is asking, didn't spiders make bonkers webs in space? Yes, yes, they did. But they make even more bonkers if you give them drugs. If you ever want to worry about humanity, look up the um, set of images of spiders that consumed marijuana, LSD, and I want to say cocaine or meth. Um, and just how screwed up those webs are. Sean Kenny suggests snakes on a space station. Get these mother effing snakes off this mother effing space station. I think a snake would be very sad in zero gravity. Yeah. Oh, like all the other animals who've been yeah. launched horribly into space and and started feeling sad almost instantaneously. <laughs> Um, David Trog is saying, uh, oh, sorry, um, Don Aker is saying mice. Mice have been in space, so yeah. have rats. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, uh, Yunus Safri asks, what is the cheapest telescope that I can buy to be able to see a planet? Uh, a pair of binoculars? Yes, but you're not really going to see much. Like, like, you can see planets with your eyeballs. I mean, the, That's bright, true. the bright objects in the sky are Jupiter and Saturn and Mars and Venus. So you can see those with your eyeballs. Behind my head is a, there we go. You can see I have um, a one scope by Celestron, which uh, you can get through the Astronomers Without Borders website. Yep. And, and that's actually a pretty good telescope that you can start to make out bands on on jupiter yeah what does one of those run not a lot yeah i mean it's a gr it's a great uh program that celestron has done because and astronomers without borders is like a really affordable reasonably sized light bucket if you go to celestron's website just do a search for the one scope you can you can find that the other one is the galileo scope of course which are they still available Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So the Galileo scope, uh, you know, I don't know what the one scope costs. It's under two hundred dollars. Under two hundred dollars. Yeah. And it's a it's a legit serious, you know, small yeah. aperture telescope. But it's you know it's going to let you see rings and and all that. Um, yeah. 
uh, rings of Saturn, bands on Jupiter. Venus is a is a crescent. Things yeah, like that. you can see that with binoculars too, which is cool. Yeah. Uh, William Van de Beek asks, will the Brexit affect astronomy? This is, of course, the yes. British leaving the EU. Yes, it will. We actually covered that in the Weekly Space Hangout. Kimberly Cartier just sort of explained a list of the the ish, the things that are going to be impacted by the, by the Brexit. And uh, we'll sort of see how that actually shakes out. The, the couple of biggest things that you have to worry about is a lot of the scientists have EU funding. Yeah. And if they lose their EU funding, while, while the UK promised that it would instate all of the science funding that was lost through Brexit, I'm not sure anyone actually believes that will happen because, well, first of all, their economy just tanked. Um, the Royal Astronomical Society actually put out a really good press release earlier today. I'd encourage everyone to go go read it. I linked to it on my Twitter feed. Um but all of the multinational agreements they're in are all going to have to be renegotiated now. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. People are sort of now trying to figure out what they voted for. Yeah. And, you know, now that now that it's happened. But uh, we're going to be sort of seeing the implications. And I guess if once this is done, other nations, if it goes very well for Britain, then other uh, nations in the EU may decide to follow. Have you seen what footsteps. happened to the pound today? Well, uh, yeah, no, and if it goes <laughs> for sure, and you know, and if it, and if it goes super poorly already, maybe they'll have to do another vote. Who knows? Um, and and one of the things on, along those lines that that got pointed out was um, until an Article Fifty. Um, call is made declaring in writing that they are withdrawing from the EU, it hasn't happened yet. So other countries have said they were going to withdraw from the EU before and then didn't because they did multiple vo votes until the correct answer was the one that came out. So there's still potentially hope until an Article 50 button is pushed. Yeah. Um... Sam Vime says, I think they thought they were voting for Braveheart. Um, uh, so David Joseph Wesley asks, what sciencey things are you going to do this summer? So I, I can tell you what I'm going to do is I'm going to learn to take a picture of the Milky Way that doesn't suck. <laughs> that is my that is my plan for the summer is to learn to take good astrophotography and follow up photoshoppery that that makes nice pictures yeah so so i i have to admit one of the reasons i'm so stupidly happy to be going camping at the rmss star party next weekend is i got a mount that will very slowly oh, rotate your camera what did you get I, the one that's on amazon that i'll send you a link hmm. um and um, so, so one of my goals is to get a, a time lapse as the sun is setting and the star party is going on, of of basically everything getting assembled and the sky rotating and everything else. And so, basically, I want to get my time lapse foo on. And I also got a GoPro camera. Uh, I've I've been testing out my ability to use it. By uh, I'm house sitting uh, entomology friends uh, giant silkworm caterpillars right now, and they are terrifying when you feed them leaves. Um, so I've I've been getting time lapses of these caterpillars like demolishing groups of leaves. Silkworm uh, caterpillars or the yeah, they're gorgeous. No. Yeah, they're 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 giant green horned caterpillars. Those aren't monarchs. Those sound like monarchs. Too. No, no, no. The, these are giant silkworm caterpillars. Wow. Okay. I look at look at my stuff on Facebook. Yep. And I think I've posted some on Twitter. Um, yeah, that sounds they're awesome. gorgeous. Oh, man, Carla would be all over that. Okay. Um, okay, <laughs> Arjun asks a, a tricky question here. Do deeply redshifted photons still exert force even though they are otherwise undetectable? So yes. I guess gravitational force? Right, photons. Well, they, they still transfer momentum. Right, but I mean, there, there's a difference between we can't detect them with the technologies we have, and they're not still 
imparting momentum when they collide into things. Right, but I guess there's two ways to look at that, right? One is, as you said, them colliding. So a deeply redshifted, you know, let's say you take a photon, it's got the the wavelength of a light year. As it crashes into something, it's going to impart momentum, right? Yes. Slowly, but it's going to, although that's a good question, right? Does it impact the, impart the momentum at the beginning of the absorption, at the end of the absorption? At the, if, it takes a, if it takes a year that's... or two... That gets into the particle wave duality. Yeah, and yeah we're not going to go into that because I am not a string theory. Okay. Kind of, yeah. Um, quantum mechanics. It's not string theory. It's right. quantum mechanics. We're, in, we're in still back in science land. Okay. So then the next question, though, is that energy exerts. We talked about black holes. Energy and mass both exert gravitational influence. Yes. So you are going to experience even if say the photon is 14, 13.8 billion light years away, redshifted almost to, you know, redshifted far out, you're still going to experience the gravity from that photon. If it's in, if it's, if the, you know, if it's within the light sphere. If we have to worry sphere. about the gravity of a photon, just, things are gone really just, weird. It's just our imagination, Pamela. That's all. I, I We're just not worried about it. No okay. one's freaking out. No one is scared okay. about the the. But the point is that you take you take a whole bunch of photons, you mash them in a small region of space. You've made a black hole, mm -hmm. and you that thing's gonna have gravity, right? Mm -hmm. That's all. That's all. Okay. Um, and Arjun says that Petapixel had an interview with Justin Ng, who takes pictures of the Milky Way in light polluted cities. Yeah, Justin Ng is a phenomenal astrophotographer, one of the best. Uh, Google his name. It's N G Ng, and I think he's out of Singapore, and he's a okay. he's a monster. Yeah, just such a great astrophotographer. And if you like pictures of the Milky Way, uh, you should follow our Universe Today Instagram channel. We are posting. Uh, we hand over the keys to the channel every day to a different astrophotographer and get their best pictures. And there's a lot of Milky Way pictures in there. A lot of people holding a flashlight but it's uh it's awesome um and if you are an astrophotographer uh, and you want to share your pictures uh just drop me a note on instagram and i'll check out your pics um patsy tucker says you need to filter your detector to filter out signals that cycle shorter than a year in the okay frank tippin says in monarch caterpillars i believe are black and yellow that's exactly right um but the the swallowtails we have here they're green and they have that horn if you poke them does this thing come out no okay. no so so do i have the ability to screen share without like breaking the universe right now no okay no you okay. could easily break the universe so okay, i wouldn't do then, that then i i will be sad uh, Galaxia asks, Pamela, do you lecture at university? No, I, I don't. Um, it's a sadness. You did. I did. And, and rules and politics and things and stuff. If I wanted to teach right now, I'd have to take a drastic, drastic pay cut. <laughs> right. And so like you myself. are, well, right. But you are on the research side of this right now. And yeah. And the university loves the fact that you bring in these gigantic NASA grants for science. And uh, they're happy to keep you doing what you're doing. We'll go with that story. That is my story. Sticking with it. Um, cool. Well, I think, uh, I think we can wrap this up. And I will be posting a picture of the caterpillar on Twitter when okay, we get you go follow, And for that reason, you should go follow Pamela on Twitter. And I will also post on Instagram, so you can follow me in both places. Maybe silkworm caterpillars would make nice pets for the International Space Station. They're, they're stunningly beautiful. Um, I, I, I did not know I would enjoy raising somebody else's caterpillars while they were on vacation. <laughs> that is awesome. Pet sitting. <laughs> um, cool. Well, let's, uh, let's wrap things up. So, hey, everybody, uh, thanks for hanging on with us for this whole season. We really appreciate it. And um, we will see you all in the new season. Thanks, Pamela. It's been a 
pleasure. It's been super fun, super entertaining. I couldn't imagine a better partner to be educating the world with. It's been so much fun. 10 and, years. And just doing dorky things like, hey, I have a T3i because you talked me into it. So thank you for being a wonderfully bad influence. <laughs> no problem. All right. We will see all of you next season. Now I have to Bye, everyone. Goodbye.